Kenny Roby here on Southern Songs and Stories. Thanks so much for joining us. Dan, thanks for having me. Tell us what you've been up to. Oh, well, not much during the pandemic, just playing some guitar, doing a little writing, um, doing some reading. That's about it. Not too much TV. We're walking in the wilderness and the mountains. Oh, good. Well, I haven't caught many. I've kind of peeked at your online presence and haven't seen you do much uh, as far as the, the online streaming shows. Have you done any of that? Do you plan on doing any of that? I'm going to do it at some point. Um, uh, I haven't really. I've done some. Uh, we made some video uh, recently at the studio where we made the newest record. Uh, early in July, we did uh, some audio and video there of us playing live in the studio. We're going to release that in some form uh, at some point. And, um, you know, at, before the record came out, there was so much going on socially, politically, and with other musicians that I knew who um, were trying to get their their stuff out there and do streaming and make some money, et cetera, and try to make up for time not on the road. So I was kind of just clearing the airwaves a little bit for that stuff, too. So just now starting to get into it now that the record's out. So sort of take my time on the stage here and now. Good. You mentioned the mountains. Where are you located now? I'm up in Woodstock, New York. So I grew up in upstate South Carolina and now I'm in upstate New York. That's great. And that's where you recorded the first floor. So much going on with this album and a lot of emotion packed into these 16 songs. There's despair, there's hope, there are characters that are lonely, broken, addicted, but there are also lighthearted moments as well. Can you tell us about what went into your lyrics and what you think listeners might take from this music? Um, you know, this record, was pretty straightforward lyrically I think and most of the content it was just was just basically just sharing what I was going through um, a lot less metaphors and uh, a lot less um, character portraits um, like I would normally do in a lot of my songs um, uh, you know just more like Hank Williams style just straight up you know, this is how I feel. This is what I'm going through. Um, just sort of an honest share. A friend of mine went to a, I think it was, a, she went to a songwriting workshop a few years back with uh, Mary Gauthier. And, and she said that Mary had one main point that she had at home uh, the whole time. She said, you know, you guys are good songwriters. Uh, you can you know, handle all kinds of writing and description. Um, and at some point in your songwriting, it gets to be about how honest you are. Um, and not in a cliche way, but just if you can be straightforward and be as honest and vulnerable as possible, that's what becomes great songwriting. Um, I think this record was more like that. It was just to be as honest as I could, to still do it in an artistic way, but but to be pretty straightforward and honest and just say, you know, this hurt, this, this hurts, this sucks, this is what I'm going through, but I still have hope and I'm still going to work through it. And uh, here's sort of my process and just sort of share that process. I think um, as far as what I would hope people would get out of it um, or get from it is maybe that honesty is that maybe they'll hear something and identify with it a little bit and, uh, and maybe you know, maybe have the courage to look at what they're going through a little deeper or to share that with other people, just sort of maybe give them permission to, to put it out there as well. Because I think whether it's depression or addiction, um, uh, suicidal tendencies, which, you know, I've had a few bouts with that. And of course, with my friend Neil Hassel killing himself and, um, and some other people that I know dying from you know, slow death from overdose or suicide, or just uh, even if they don't die, just suffering greatly. Um, I think that those dragons, as they call them, or the monsters or those diseases or whatever they are, I think they, they thrive in isolation, um, as a lot of us are. 
experiencing now. And they kind of thrive in darkness and dampness and uh, they get bigger there. And uh, I think when you can share that, maybe if it's not always in a public forum, but you know, share that with other people who are going through some of the same stuff and can identify with that and you can identify with them. I think it, when you expose that to that light or that, that sunlight or, or whatever that light is, um, that those sort of creatures uh, lose at least some of their power um, with that exposure. Um, so yeah, identification is huge, um, you know, in a positive way. Um, you know, misery loves com company also, <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about wallowing in it. I'm just talking about, you know, uh, people relating to each other. And uh, I think humans really need that. Uh, I think we're experiencing that now. We need, uh, no matter how much we think we're independent and want to be alone and we're original in our thoughts, um, I think we all uh, have a lot more in common than we, than we are different. And um, with our humanness and our human experience, I think it's really important um, that we do have a sense of fellowship and community. And that's really hard right now. So I think, um, you know, a lot of people seem to be relating to this record now that may not have related so much to it six months ago before the pandemic and everything going on. And this pandemic, I think, magnifies some of this isolation that some of us already go through. So we have to be really careful. You know, pretense is not a word that I would have associated with your solo work or with six string drag, but that, that honesty, that humility that you allude to right there, I think it's at a new level with the reservoir. It's just laid bare. So tell us a little bit about the journey with Neil Casal starting out with this record and then bringing in Dave Schools. Um, well, Neil and I have known each other for a long time. Um, we met back in 96 through our mutual friend and uh, manager, Gary Waldman. Um, uh, right around the time uh, we were finishing up uh, Hi-Hat, uh, our second record that was on Steve Earle's label that he had produced. Um, and uh, Neil, uh, Neil and I hit it off r right away, uh, both kind of being roots music geeks and uh, just sort of students of that that stuff, uh, just fanboys, um, and just had a lot of you know, a lot in common. You know, um, both. You know, it's interesting. We talk about uh, isolation and and. You, you think of people who are struggling with things and isolation or depression or whatever it is that they're always the, um, you know, sort of somber, uh, I guess withdrawn, um, cats, uh, like Nick Drake characters, you know, those kind of musicians, but, but, you know, there's, there's guys like Neil and I who are super outgoing and kind of gregarious and, and, opinionated, outspoken, and uh, sort of at times, sort of those fun-loving uh, guys. Um, I think Neil and I related in that way. We both had a side of us that was, you know, had some darkness and just could be sort of reclusive, and uh, but also had a side of us that was just outgoing and fun-loving and, and goofy. And uh, I think we relate to each other in that way. Um, a lot of us musicians do. Um, and Neil and I, when Six String Drag broke up in 98, Neil invited me to open up for him solo on a European tour, which we did England, Ireland, Scotland uh, for about five weeks. And then we spent a little time in France together as well. So we got even closer then and um, kept in touch over the years and would send each other records of, uh, of our own stuff or demos, um, kept in touch in and out here and there. And um, the last few years, um, when he started touring with uh, Chris Robinson Brotherhood more, um, they started doing the East Coast a lot and they were playing Raleigh a couple times a year. So I would go out and either see them or meet him for dinner um, or when he was playing with Circles Around the Sun, they were starting to play around some as well. Um, and I I had sent Gary Waldman a couple of my new songs. Um, 
and Gary played them for Neil because Gary was out on some of the circles around the sun. And, and Neil texted me, man, I'd really like to hear more of this stuff. These songs are really, really good. Uh, he said he thought they were kind of next level for me. And I think it was Old Love and one other song that I sent him or that Gary had played for him. And then I said, great, man, I'll, I'll send you some more stuff. Uh, I got this other one that I need to make a demo of. And I made a demo um, on my iPhone uh, really quickly of a brand new song. Don't you know what's on my mind? Well, it wasn't brand new. It was a few months old, um, but I'd never played it before. I picked it up and just started strumming on the guitar, doing this little Woody Guthrie, Carter family kind of run and uh, sang it really quickly into the phone. And uh, basically the first take I ever did completely of it or played through the song, I recorded it and I sent it to Neil and he started uh, calling my phone, which was really rare for Neil. We, we generally texted. <laughs> Um, so I was like, why is Neil calling? And then, uh, I looked at a message and he said, man, uh, I got to talk to you. Uh, I'll, I want to work on this in some form. Um, he said some, Neil and I are both full of hyperbole. He said something like, oh, I, I'd walk a hundred miles through barbed wire to work on this record, man. This is the one I want to work on. And we had talked for a long time throughout the years about, doing some stuff together i think at one point like uh we we would always daydream about how funny it would be for like ryan adams and him and i to make like a trio record of all of us writing and playing together and performing together i'm sure the room would have exploded in some form but uh in some way but uh anyway Long story short is he, we just, I called him and he was like, man, whatever capacity, he said, if I play guitar, I don't care. If I produce it, I don't care. If you don't want me to do either of those things and be involved in that way, I, I need to get this stuff off to somebody who can. He said, I'll use whatever connections I can to help you out. So we texted and talked back and forth a couple of times and kind of came to the conclusion that, that, that it'd be great if he'd produce the record and uh, started about songs or demo, demos of stuff I'd written a few months before and um, we had already had plans to where we're going to do the record in California where he'd worked before out um, uh, near Mill Valley area overlooking the ocean it's going to be beautiful he was going to produce I was just going to show up and sing for once instead of having to co-produce too much or put the band together and we'd lined everything up and uh, and uh, I didn't hear from him but a few times in July um, here and there and then in August we started ramping things up a little bit more and uh, literally one morning I was surprised I was going to post a video about the, the crowdfunding campaign um, and a song I had done, a little, little video I had done, and uh, I was about to upload it and I get um, these texts from people, man, I'm really sorry about Neil. And I was like, well, what's going on? And, and Gary had, I'd seen that Gary had called the night before and, you know, for some reason he just said, hey, uh, call me. And um I didn't see it till the next morning and I called him and, and Gary told me that, that Neil had died and that he killed himself. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, obviously all of us were completely a loop. Um, I knew he'd been some at times, but uh, you know, I thought he'd been coming out of it. Uh, uh, I think he had for a while and then he kind of went back down the hole, I guess. Um, you know, and at, at first I, I didn't even think for a week or so, I didn't really think about the record much at all. I wasn't really that concerned with it. And then, um, Gary told me about the, the letter that Neil had left and one part of the letter it had said, you know, just to paraphrase, he'd said, uh, you know, can he go, go ahead and do the record? He said, uh, you know, it's all set up. Um, everything's in place and he said the work's already done and you, you know the songs are phenomenal so really just get in there and do them um and neil and i 
you know, Neil and I have talked and, and I'll have to edit the language here, but you know, he said, basically our goal is just to not to blank this up, you know, just not get in the way um, of these songs and, and just get your voice out there and let people hear the lyrics and everything else is just, uh, just accompaniment to that. And uh, he said, uh, it, this should be easy. Um, and all we can do is mess it up by overthinking it. So let's not overthink it. And so um, Gary and I were sort of brainstorming like, well, you know, I really would still like somebody to produce this. I still don't want to go in and, and, and me kind of have to produce too much. I still just want to go in there and do my job of performing these songs and light arrangement with the band. But, um, and we sort of had the idea of, of, of talking to Dave, we, you know, Dave had been doing a lot more producing the last few years and, and, uh, you know, Dave as well produced, you know, the hard work and American stuff. And that was sort of his baby. And, uh, I like that stuff and I really like that band. Um, and so we approached Dave and, and he was all about it. Um, and then I found out, after talking to him on the phone, he goes, well, I got to tell you, I got to be honest, Neil's been sending me these songs of your demos already. Um, and he's, and he'd really been digging them. Um, so he said, I already, you know, and, and I already knew about the songs and I was already a fan. Um, and him and Neil always shared, had been sharing uh, artists, demos and rough mixes and things like that. Of, uh, of songs they'd been producing or bands and artists they'd been producing. So, and, and Dave, Dave and I had some Athens connections as well um, because we used to play the hi-hat all the time, which is partly what our six string drag record hi-hat was named after. We had a lot of mutual friends. Um, uh, Todd, the uh, original drummer in widespread, um, played in a band with one of our old guitar players in Six Street Drag, William Tonks, um, called Barbecue, which was sort of an NRBQ <laughs> cover band. Um, and they did some other covers as well. So, you know, we had a lot of connections and uh, we knew a lot of the same people and hung out a lot of the same places. And he was like, oh, I probably saw Six String Drag back in the day and, and it, back in the 90s when he was off the road. Um, so yeah, there was enough connection there um, between both being good friends with Neil and then the Athens thing, and a lot of mutual friends. And we also just spoke the same language. Dave's goal was to um, just get out of the way as well. He said, I, ju I'm just, I just wanna be here to help you facilitate your vision and what you and Neil had envisioned and I'll pick up the ball um, for that. And, and that was Neil's goal as well, just to sort of lift the music up and support it and not get in the way. Um, so that is a long version of the story. The natural world seems pretty important to you. What do you get out of being outdoors? Um, you know, I really, uh, I really think it's healthy for me to get out into really big spaces um sort of talking about the isolation thing but also the perspective uh of being small in a big space in a, in a healthy way um i think that's really good to get a perspective to see you know how um how impermanent and how sort of small our lives are in, in a positive way i used to uh it's funny i was thinking about this the other day that um i used to have fever dreams when i was a little kid and one of the dreams, recurring ones, and one of them was I was sitting next to a, an elderly lady, kind of small and frail, and she had like a basket in her hand and, you know, like a bread basket with a handle. And, and I was four or five, real small at the time. And, and I assumed it was probably like my grandmother or grandmother figure. And every time I would look in the basket, 
to see what was in the basket, I would get this sense of being so small and like a bug and insignificant and not in a, a good powerless way, but in a like very frail, insecure, feeble sort of, uh, um, insignificant in another way, like made to feel small kind of way. I would get this feeling and then I would look up and I would see like giant plates of earth, like flat rocks, like they were so big, they would block out the sky coming down on me. And then I would wake up from the dream. And the point of the story is like at that time in my life, um, uh, when I was a kid, it was, it was a different kind of thing, a powerlessness. It, like I said, it was a, insignificant or afraid. It was a lot of fear and um, like that world was going to crush me and uh, very frail. Um, and, you know, we could go into that forever. Why? Like my family and my surroundings. Um, but uh, I'm sure it's not that original of a story anyway. Um, but now I like being open in open spaces and I kind of embrace that um, to recognize sort of my impermanence when I'm sort of stuck in my ego, stuck in my story and my fears and uh, my projections onto the world. Uh, I realize that, uh, that life's short and um, I can only do so much. It takes a lot of the pressure off when I can get into open spaces um, and just the vastness and the beauty of it. Uh, I love traveling out west the last few years and driving up into mountains and into desert spaces and just, you know, the, just the vast beauty of it all and the timelessness of it almost. Um, it's very, it's very freeing, I think, in that way. Um, takes the pressure off thinking you're so dang important. You like to cycle too. You know? <laughs> Where do you go when you cycle? Um, well, my strength to weight ratio is slightly off now <laughs> the last few years because I've been riding a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, in the mountains is really nice or flats near beaches is really nice. Um, there's a really nice rail trail system around here, a couple different trails that intersect. So you can put in a lot of miles just cruising around um, and uh, safely away from cars where I can put some earbuds in and listen to some audio books or um uh stories or music and you know, just kind of get in a groove and get out there and get lost in it uh, i don't run on the roads much around here there's not a lot of shoulders um and there's a lot of blind curves but you know a little bit i used to ride uh, a lot more on the road uh, a few years back when my strength to weight ratio was a little more in balance <laughs> that's there's the that's really important in cycling right have only got a few minutes that the uh, recording will let us have as far as I understand. I've only got a 30 minute limit. But mm -hmm. getting back to the music, can you tell us uh, about your upbringing and your dad was a choir director in church, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us anything about how the church growing up might have factored into your understanding of music or, or the sound, the kind of music that you're making now? Um, you know, it was kind of weird. Uh, I grew up uh, 70s and 80s in uh, Southern Catholic Church. Um, so it wasn't so much gospel. It was, um, it probably had as much to do with uh, a lot more to do with James Taylor <laughs> and Peter, Paul and Mary than, um, uh, than the staple singers. Um, but, um, but we did listen to some of that stuff growing up. Um, my dad was big into Ray Charles and, um, you know, so there was some more like traditional gospel stuff around. Um, like I said, in the 70s, there was big folk movement in, uh, uh, in the Catholic Church. Um, a lot of acoustic trios um, doing things like Be Not Afraid and those kind of songs. Um, so, you know, that had an effect on me. Uh, my sisters sang a lot of harmony together. Um, and they would sing old country songs or show tunes together. Um, my sisters were really good singers. My oldest sister, uh, not my oldest sister, my second oldest sister, Kathy, uh, 
went to Oberlin Music Conservatory for voice and she's an amazing singer and um, was, you know, all state soloist in South Carolina in high school. And uh, so, yeah, my dad was a choir director. He was a baritone and a bass singer. He was also in um, barbershop quartets and choirs in upstate South Carolina. So that was around a lot of show tunes um, and a lot of country too. My dad was big in the Hank Williams and also Don Williams and a lot of that 70s stuff and Charlie Pride. And they were also in a lot of vocalists too, like uh, Johnny Mathis and Bing Crosby, um, some Sinatra. Um, so there was a lot of vocal music around my house. Um, uh, not so much instrumental music. Um, if there was jazz, it would have been vocal jazz, um, some classical. Um, but yeah, definitely the singing thing definitely had an effect on me. I'm, I'm like one of the only non-trained singers <laughs> in my family, which is kind of ironic because I somewhat do it for a living. Um, but uh, not a lot of writers in my family. Um, my brother's a sort of a historian, um, so he writes and, and is a storyteller as well. Um, but yeah, it definitely had an effect being around it. You know, I was never in the choir, really. Um, I was the little drummer boy once in the little drummer boy. I played the lead in the little drummer boy in church. So, you know, I do have acting experience as well. <laughs> well, Kenny, I think that's gonna be about it for our time today. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I wish I could talk to you some more and I may wanna follow up with some more questions and as I work Great. on said and and get this thing crafted but so nice to meet you virtually and we're looking forward to playing more of the reservoir here at wncw oh uh, thank you so much for having me i appreciate it thanks can you read me on songs and stories bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.